Hello and welcome to the next installment this semester of the International Postdoc Forum for the Philosophy of Science hosted by the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science. My name is Alan Love. I'm the director of the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science and I am delighted uh, to have Asita Jelapu joining us today. Before I introduce her talk, let me just briefly highlight uh, the program that we are involved in today, which is something that we began during the um, pandemic when we could only do uh, online activities. Um, and we saw that uh, this was having a disproportionate effect on recent PhDs and emerging scholars and losing opportunities to present their work. And we thought this would be a possibility for that, but the response has been very positive to our previous iterations. And so we decided to continue with it, even as there is at least a glimmer of hope that uh, uh, the pandemic is uh, winding down and some of our uh, more regular scholarly activities will be picking up again. Uh, so it is my great delight to have joining us Zita Chalapu from the Open University. Um, but before I highlight her title, let me just say, some of you might be thinking, wait a second, uh, she was listed at, from uh, uh, Ruhr University in uh, Bochum um, uh, on the poster. And that's because she actually now has a position at the Open University. And so we are very excited for her and congratulate her for that uh, um, uh, happening between the time that we invited her to give this postdoc forum talk and the present time. Uh, so we've just made it in time to have her present. Um, I want to uh, let people know a little bit about her history. Uh, she uh, came from the uh, uh, Cambridge HPS department, where she took her PhD. And before that, she had been at the London School of Economics doing a master's uh, degree in their logic, scientific method, and philosophy program. Um, she's interested broadly in a number of questions, cultural evolution being only one. Uh, she has some recent papers that people might uh, uh, be interested in in synthes that came out last year, Rethinking Prestige Bias, uh, related to some of our topics for today, but also a chapter that just came out in a book, Global Epistemologies and Philosophy of Science, her chair, uh, Cultural Evolution, a Case Study in Global Epistemologies of Science. So without further ado, uh, let me invite Azita to give us her presentation on unpacking uh, uh, politics and values in cultural evolution. Azita, please. Great. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, okay, I'll just share my screen. Is that all right? Yes, you can see it. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, so this will be the rough structure of my talk. Uh, I will start with some brief background on the application of evolutionary theory to culture. I'll introduce cultural evolution a little bit, what it is, how it differs from other kinds of interactions between evolution and culture, uh, like evolutionary psychology, and give a little bit of a sense of the variation of approaches within cultural evolution. And then I'll motivate why I think discussing the role of values in cultural evolution is worthwhile, what my aims are with this work, uh, and sketch how I see non-epistemic values shaping cultural evolution research, both in its construction and in the potential for broader consequences. And then I'll zoom in on two aspects of cultural evolutionary models, which bring in particular political or ethical considerations. So firstly, the de-emphasizing of human agency, and secondly, the construction of thin descriptions of culture. So there is a long and often dark history of the application of evolutionary theory to human societies. Um, there is a lot of scholarship on this, and I'm only going to give the very briefest overview here. Going back to Darwin himself, Darwin contrasted civilized races with what he called savage races, claiming that over time the struggle for existence would mean that civilized races would exterminate the savage races. 
Um, of course, this history includes things like social Darwinism, where Darwinian evolution was used or misused to advocate for, for example, laissez-faire capitalism, and to argue against policies that would help the poor or disadvantaged. And this formed part of the ideological justification for 19th century enslavement and colonization. Uh, and there are examples coming from the work of Herbert Spencer, the 19th century proponent of Darwinian evolution, who famously coined the term survival of the fittest, um, and his application of Darwinism to human societies. Uh, so the assumption that evolution works towards a goal or peak and that Western civilization represents the pinnacle of evolutionary progress. For example, in the social organism, he compares society to a living organism and argues that just as biological organisms evolve through natural selection, society evolves and increases in complexity through analogous processes. And of course, uh, worries about the degeneration of the human race led Francis Galton to draw on principles of heredity to argue for policies of eugenics. Although many of the darkest aspects of evolutionary understandings of human behavior have been jettisoned in recent years on both political and scientific grounds, evolutionary approaches to culture um, continue to be controversial. So some somewhat more recent examples of this include sociobiology and evolutionary psychology. So sociobiology in the 70s and 80s, uh, defined by E. O. Wilson as the extension of population biology and evolutionary theory to social organization, um, was seeking to explain behavior as a product of natural selection. And this research program drew criticism because of the way that it appeared to naturalize, for example, racism or sexism by attributing adaptive value to these behaviors. Uh, and then more recently and still ongoing is evolutionary psychology. Uh, in general, evolutionary psychologists aim to identify human psychological traits that are evolved adaptations, so the functional products of natural selection. And they see the human mind as being made up of a suite of evolved adaptations or modules that are genetically inherited. Uh, and these include um, modules such as the ability to infer the emotions of others, to discern kin from non-kin, to identify and prefer healthier mates and cooperate with others and so on. And some of the most controversial examples of evolutionary psychology research include work on race and attractiveness or the preferences of men for younger women. And there has been sustained criticism of, um, of evolutionary psychology uh, and earlier sociobiology, both on epistemic and non-epistemic grounds. And so now on to cultural evolution. Uh, cultural evolution shares with evolutionary psychology this very broad aim of using the tools of evolutionary theory to explain or understand cultural phenomena. However, there's some really important differences. Crucially, cultural evolution typically emphasizes cultural rather than genetic transmission and inheritance. Um, and an, although cultural evolution researchers uh, use tools from evolutionary biology to explain aspects of culture, uh, these theorists take cultural phenomena as important objects of study in their own right that often can't be reduced to the genetic or to the biological, um, although there is also work on this gene culture coevolution. Early work within cultural evolution, uh, such as cultural transmission and evolution, a quantitative approach by Cavalli, Swartza and Feldman, and culture and the evolutionary process by Boyd and Richardson, set out to understand the population level processes that give rise to cultural change through the application of mathematical models adapted primarily from population genetics and ecology. So we have this dual inheritance approach where human behavior is shaped by both genetic and cultural evolution and modeling these population level processes of transmission and inheritance can provide important insights into the spread and development of cultural traits. Cultural evolution is a very broad church that's comprised of various approaches or schools uh, which differ in their targets of explanation, their theoretical commitments and empirical methodologies. Uh, 
One of these is the California School, which includes the work of Peter Richardson, Robert Boyd and Joseph Henrik. Uh, and they're often concerned with the appearance of adaptive fit of a cultural trait with the environment, uh, particularly in the face of causal opacity, uh, which prevents individual learning from being access successful. So when we can't work out, or it's very difficult to work out relationships between cause and effect. Uh, and the work at the California School often involves cultural selection, um, which can be roughly understood as an analog of natural selection, where we might have cumulative selection on cultural traits uh, that could lead to complex cultural adaptations. And many of the examples that the California School draw on uh, are of adaptations found in small scale societies, such as um, particular ethno-botanical knowledge that allows those communities to effectively utilize environmental resources. And they're often concerned with cultural difference. So these specific adaptations to specific um, circumstances. And also part of this, uh, one part of this is also cultural group selection, which is selection acting on cultural groups rather than just individuals, which I will come back to later. And then we also have the Paris School, which includes the work of Dan Sperber, Olivier Morin and Nicolas Claudier, uh, also called cultural epidemiology, which is in contrast often concerned with the endurance of particular traditions. So why certain cultural traits persist and are repeatedly transmitted while a vast number are not. Uh, and part, in, part of this work involves positing these factors of attraction. So factors that probabilistically bias how mental representations cause particular public productions, practices, behaviors, whatever, and so cause cultural attraction to occur uh, and cultural attraction is just the favoring of certain types of items or traits over others uh, which then affects the frequency of those items or traits in a population um, and then the factors of attraction are themselves shaped by features of human cognition and the learning environment. And these schools are often uh, somewhat at odds so many in the Paris school are quite skeptical of cultural selection uh, or cultural group selection, and there's some disagreement about how cultural traits actually spread, whether it's a replicative or reconstructive process. That's something I'll also come back to later. Uh, however, both what both these schools share is a commitment to population thinking. So they emphasize population-based explanations of cultural change or stasis. And population thinking involves abstraction away from particular features of individuals in order to represent patterns of population change. So individuals are typically represented as varying in a limited number of ways, and their interactions and decisions can be aggregated into population level patterns. And we can think about this in contrast to ethnographers, for example, who, typ who typically attempt to capture cultural phenomena in high levels of detail, attending closely to individual differences. So the California School and the Paris School are, are two pretty prominent approaches. Um, and as I've said, they have some deep differences, but also some key similarities. Uh, but I just want to note that these aren't the only approaches on offer. Uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned and won't mention much is memetics, uh, which most of you uh, probably heard of, a little bit familiar with the concept of the meme, uh, but I won't spend too much time on this here. Uh, it's my sense that there have been these various uh, strong critiques of, for example, this the analogy or lack of analogy between memes and genes, uh, and memetics is now largely out of favor in cultural evolution research, although there are still some proponents. But the other important approach to mention at this point is an evo-devo approach that emphasizes the role of development and cultural scaffolding. So the work of William Wimsat and James Griesemer, as well as this recent edited collection from uh, Alan Love and William Wimsat. So thinking through development in culture would mean considering, for example, the impact of sequential dependencies in the acquisition of cultural traits. So paying attention to these trajectories of individual learning and development and the ways in which these trajectories impact or produce particular patterns of cultural transmission or inheritance. And by cultural scaffolding, 
Uh, this means structures such as social institutions, organizations, and technological infrastructure, which scaffold and facilitate learning and therefore cumulative cultural change. Uh, and I want to flag up that in my talk title, I've referenced cultural evolution, but I will actually really be focusing primarily on the California school. So cultural selection and cultural group selection in particular. Uh, however, what I will do is try to note where the issues that I identify with the arguments I make apply or where they don't apply to other forms of cultural evolution. So by and large, cultural evolution hasn't been subjected to the kinds of critiques leveled at sociobiology and evolutionary psychology, um, and I mean non-epistemic critiques in particular. Given that most or at least some cultural evolution research doesn't rely on genetic or biological transmission, inheritance or adaptation, Perhaps many of the particular critiques of evolutionary psychology, so for example, charges of genetic or biological determinism, just simply don't apply here. And maybe it's the case that the more striking examples in evolutionary psychology, such as some of the fringe work that I have mentioned on, for example, race and attractiveness, um, we don't really get something similar in cultural evolution. So maybe there's some reason for this. Uh, however, it is the case that there are many anthropologists and social scientists that remain highly suspicious of cultural evolution research. Um, and with some exceptions that I will touch on later, there hasn't been a wealth of explicit critique from anthropologists, uh, from social cu cultural anthropologists in the, in the literature, but there is this sense, I think, of general suspicion or disdain. I think clearly something is going on here. Uh, and I want to suggest that non-epistemic values do figure in um, to cultural evolution in important ways. They have so far gone on or under acknowledged and perhaps these non-epistemic worries go some way towards explaining the, this divide or this sense of suspicion. So these are the uh, broad claims that I'm making. So firstly, that cultural selection claims or inferences or theories can have non-epistemic consequences. I'll try to show that. And then secondly, that non-epistemic values um, then shape or also shape cultural selection models, the construction of cultural selection models or explanations. Um, as I've just mentioned, I'm focusing on cultural selection work specifically, and primarily the work of the California School. I think this applies to varying extents to the Paris School uh, and to other cultural evolutionary approaches. And I'm going to focus on two aspects of cultural selection in particular. Firstly, the ways in which these uh, models or explanations de-emphasize human agency. And secondly, uh, the construction of thin descriptions of cultural phenomena. And in my analysis, I'll be drawing on work from feminist epistemology, uh, although what I'm not doing here is advocating for any one particular framework from feminist epistemology by which to understand the incursion or role of values in this research. And I think there are probably multiple ways that we could understand this. Okay, so firstly, de-emphasizing human agency. I want to start with a quote from Tim Ingold, who is one of the anthropologists who has published critiques and ha has been explicitly critical of cultural evolution. And he writes here that cultural evolution is an affront to millions of intelligent human beings for whom traditions are real and important, but who are not on that account trait bearing cultural clones whose only role in life is to express in their behavior, artifacts and organizations information that has been transmitted to them from previous generations only to have their performances observed and recorded in their natural habitat, along with other forms of wildlife by intruding scientists. So here I've emphasized this phrase, trait-bearing cultural clones, um, and I take it that what Ingold is getting at here is something like this downplaying or de-emphasizing or even elimination of human agency in cultural evolutionary theorizing. 
So I want to make the following claims. Firstly, I want to show that cultural selection models do in fact often downplay or de-emphasize human agency. I want to suggest that this does have non-epistemic consequences, and in particular that this might contribute to the othering of marginalized groups. And I want to suggest that the othering of marginalized groups might contribute to the intuitive plausibility or pursuit of cultural selection explanations, at least in particular cases. So I'm going to use a specific example to illustrate this. Uh, this is a paper from 2010 by Henrik and Henrik. They carry out a study in Fiji looking at food taboos, which they characterize as a case of prestige bias transmission. So as they describe it in Fiji, there are certain marine species that can carry a high risk of toxins, and this is particularly dangerous for fetuses or nursing infants. And there are also food taboos for pregnant and breastfeeding women around these species. And pregnant and breastfeeding women acquire these taboos both from close female relatives and from Yelewa Vuku, or wise women. So these are women in the community who are considered particularly knowledgeable or experienced when it comes to pregnancy, childbirth, child rearing, and so on. And so we have a behavior, so avoiding this potentially toxic fish species during pregnancy and breastfeeding, which is adaptive in the sense that it's beneficial. And Henrik and Henrik are using a cultural selection approach that relies on the existence of broad social learning biases to explain the emergence and maintenance of this cultural adaptation. So according to Henrik and Henrik, close female relatives are low cost, accessible learning models who share fitness incentives with the learner. And these Yele Wavuku are preferred models. So they're higher cost because they're less accessible, but by selectively learning from them, learners can improve on the cultural variants acquired from their family members. And over time, this tendency stabilizes a population at an adaptive equilibrium. And so in some, the adaptive behavior of avoiding toxic marine species is explained through patterns of bias transmission. And here are some direct quotes from the paper um, that hopefully bring out this de-emphasizing of agency in this case. So they say, many of the practices found in human societies appear functionally well-designed to address local environmental challenges, often in ingenious ways not recognized by the people themselves. Natural selection shapes the social learning abilities that lead individuals to selectively focus their attention on those people, models most likely to possess adaptive information. If some members of every generation tend to use model-based cues to prefer preferentially learn from the more successful, skilled, and healthier members of the previous generation, the population level distributions of beliefs and practices will evolve to an equilibrium that maximizes the success, skill, and health of members, approximating optimal fitness, giving rise to emergent culturally evolved adaptive repertoires. And just to make this even clearer and, and highlight how agency has really been taken out in the Henrik and Henrik case, I want to just introduce this uh, contrast case. So let's imagine that we have a woman living in Cambridge who becomes pregnant for the first time. As she's concerned for the health of her fetus, she wants to avoid any behaviors that would affect its health negatively during her pregnancy. And so she consults her mother, her family GP, and the NHS webpage on which foods to avoid during pregnancy. When asked why she chose these sources of information, she explains that she wants to learn from the experiences of her mother, who's been through several pregnancies, and that she places trust in the expertise of her family GP and the recommendations of the NHS. After consulting these sources, she decides to avoid soft cheeses with white rinds, such as brie and camembert, and this, de this decision is beneficial as these cheeses are known to contain listeria. Okay, so in both the Fiji and the Cambridge case, uh, we have the expression of an adaptive behavior in that it promotes the health of the fetus, which is acquired through social learning. The individuals in question selectively learn from close female relatives and preferred models. 
But in the Fiji case, this is given a gloss where it's about these blind population level processes of transmission. Uh, and in the Cambridge case, I hope it's clear that we're really centering the agency of the pregnant woman. We're acknowledging she has a particular goal to preserve the health of her fetus and she's seeking out knowledge actively that will help her achieve this goal. And I just want to note that I haven't picked a, a unusual case. This is part of a, a wider trend within cultural selection or California school research. Um, and sometimes this is made explicit. So Henrik in his book, The Secret of Our Success, identifies a class of cultural phenomena that are arguably underexplained by historical, anthropological, or sociological frameworks. And he proposes that these should be a particular target of cultural selection explanations. And this is those behaviors which are adaptive in that they're beneficial to an individual or group, but crucially where individuals are perhaps not aware of why these behaviors are adaptive, uh, would find it difficult to find out why these are adaptive and haven't designed them specifically to be so. And here we have causal opacity again coming in. So the idea is that um, an intentional, maybe goal-directed account might struggle to deal with these cases where we have uh, causal opacity because we can't discern cause of an effect and therefore we can't um, discern the effect of our behavior and, and uh, thereby actively consciously choose it. So uh, at this point, I should note that um, the de-emphasization of agent, de-emphasis de of agency applies most clearly to cultural selection approaches in particular. Um, and as I've noted, often the explanatory payoffs of these approaches hinge on agency playing a minimal role. This applies to a lesser extent to the cultural epidemiology of the Paris school. Um, although I do think there's a possibility of this here as well. Um, so scholars in the Paris school often place an emphasis on the reconstruction of cultural traits as they're transmitted from individual to individual rather than replication. So this means in acquiring a cultural trait, individuals are using their inferential and other cognitive abilities to reconstruct it rather than an automatic social learning biases model uh, where we get this high fidelity replication. And we might think that this reconstruction process allows for agency a little bit more. However, to the extent that there are factors of attraction that explain particular cultural patterns, whether they be psychological, um, whether they be evolved modules, say, or, or other factors that might also end up minimizing the role of agency or human goal-directed action. And this issue of agency also uh, doesn't apply so much to, for example, this Evo Devo approach. Um, if you are emphasizing the complexity of cultural systems and embracing maybe a kind of plural, pluralism or interdisciplinarity, um, where you're explicitly attempting to integrate work um, integrate sort of cultural evolution with work that brings human agency to the forefront, whether that be anthropological, sociological, or historical. So I hope that I've shown that the minimization of agency is in fact a feature, at least of cultural selection models. Uh, and so I'll now move on to my second claim that this has social or political consequences. I think this has particular consequences when considering uh, cultural evolution research that is carried out with or explores cultural phenomena in non-Western or historically marginalized populations. Um, it's certainly the case that cultural evolution research is also carried out um, to a not insignificant degree in Western populations. Uh, however, there is a decent proportion that is carried out in groups uh, in the Global South and more specifically indigenous groups. And given the wider social and political context, we might expect that the consequences of developing and applying these kinds of models in non-Western or indigenous communities to differ from their application in a Western context, the minimizing of agency might not always have the same effect. But in the cases where it does have this negative effect, 
I think that um, this de-emphasizing of agency can contribute to the construction of an us and a them. So in the example I just mentioned, we would have our pregnant women who use their agency and decision-making capacities to come to an informed decision about what's best for their children by taking on board the advice of family and experts versus their pregnant women who are, in Ingold's words, trait-bearing cultural clones. Uh, and more precisely, I want to suggest that this contributes to othering. So uh, Lister defines othering as a process of differentiation and demarcation by which the line is drawn between us and them, between the more and less powerful, and through which social distance is established and maintained. This process paves the way for the dehumanization of the other. It plays a role in license, licensing acts of violence and oppression or prescribing ethical boundaries. Gertrude Spivak in her 1985 essay, The Rani of Samoa, provides one of the first systematic developments of the concept through her analysis of British colonial power in India. Uh, and she outlines three dimensions of othering. So firstly, the demonstration of power over subordinates. Secondly, the construction of the other as inferior. And thirdly, the construction of the powerful as the owners of knowledge and technology. I think this, this third dimension is especially relevant. So Linda Tuhiwai Smith in her book, Decolonizing Methodologies, builds on the work of Edward Said to spell out the ways in which the construction of the other has historically involved precisely the minimization of agency. So she describes how indigenous peoples have been treated as objects of research and, object, and objects of research do not have a voice and do not contribute to research or science. Um, and this is not just a historical process, it continues to have material consequences for those who are othered. Um, here are just some examples from uh, slightly more recent empirical literature, suggesting, for example, that the, the othering can contribute to marginalization and exclusion, can affect healthcare, uh, denial of healthcare or health outcomes. The othering contributes to barriers to learning in the classroom. Um, and that othering contributes to lower educational attainment and higher probability of exclusion from school. So it can have material consequences, but it can also uh, have epistemic consequences and contribute to epistemic violence. And epistemic violence broadly refers to harms that are brought about by discourse. And so one aspect of epistemic violence is silencing marginalized groups, as well as the dismissal of local knowledge in order to privilege a subset of epistemic practices, typically Western. And so when groups of people who have historically been denied agency are described in terms that once again strip them of their agency, this could have the potential to reinforce hierarchies of who is and is not afforded their full humanity, and who is and is not considered a knower. So I want to emphasize here that although I think these consequences are real and very much need to be considered, I don't want to be taken as making any really strong claims uh, that these cultural selection models, theories, explanations have extreme or very direct effects. I think the consequences are likely diffuse and difficult to trace. Um, and if they, do in fact feed into these processes, then they form, um, of course, a tiny part of the giant patchwork of institutions, social structures, individual attitudes, state actions, and systems of knowledge production that produce and maintain these power relations and hierarchies. So now to the third claim which is that the othering of marginalized groups is not only a possible consequence, but may also contribute to the plausibility or pursuit of cultural selection explanations, uh, at least in particular cases. So to return to this Fiji versus Cambridge example, uh, I think that uh, it's an interesting question uh, to ask why does a cultural selection explanation seem plausible in the Fiji case, or at least plausible enough to be published, and yet intuitively highly implausible in the Cambridge case. Uh, so elsewhere, I've argued for the usefulness of comparing uh, intentional or goal-directed agent explanations with cultural, ex cultural selection explanations. I won't go into the details here, but 
uh, broadly, I think that in terms, uh, when we think about the explanatory gains we get from applying cultural selection, um, in a case like the Fijian food taboos, we don't really get much over and above applying sort of naive or basic goal-directed agent account. Uh, so then why bring in this extra machinery when the kinds of goal-directed explanations we use all the time in everyday life seem to fare just as well? Although this is difficult to demonstrate conclusively or maybe even persuasively, I would suggest that the broader historical or political context of othering particular groups might contribute to the pursuit or adoption of cultural explanations in this case, or at least in some cases. And just to finish up this section, how should we think about the role of values here? So perhaps uh, if we are convinced of the potentially negative social or political consequences, um, we could think of the these kinds of models or explanations that de-emphasize agency as incurring inductive risk or epistemic risk or frenetic risk. Um, so uh, Justin Biddle and Quill Kukla define frenetic risk as epistemic risks that arise through the course of activities that are preconditions for or parts of an parts of empirical reasoning insofar as these are risks that need to be managed and balanced in the light of values and interests so this is meant as a broader category than inductive risk if you want to restrict inductive risk to um, cases of statistical significance thresholds or something like that um, so we might think that frenetic risk arises when we're making this decision to adopt or pursue models or explanations that downplay or minimize agency. So insofar as there are foreseeable negative consequences, we have to weigh those consequences. And this wouldn't necessarily lead to the claim that we should just stop all this research, um, but rather we might think we need to be very explicit and consider the risks carefully. So now uh, I'm going to turn to the other feature of cultural selection that I want to pick up on and here are the claims I'm making. I'll show that cultural selection models often rely on the construction of thin descriptions of cultural phenomena. I'll suggest that the process of constructing thin descriptions involves making choices about which aspects of phenomenon to retain and which to discard, some of which may be value laden. And I'll suggest that the privileging of generalizability over other epistemic values may also be value laden. So the construction of thin descriptions is something that quite a lot of people have picked up on as part of um, uh, as part of this, these discussions around cultural evolution, either as positive or as a criticism. Here are just a couple of quotes from a paper by Alex Masudi, Andrew Whiten, and Kevin Leyland. Um, and here they say, uh, why has biology been so much more successful than anthropology and many related fields of social science during the past 150 years? First is the relative willingness of biologists to make simplifying assumptions and use what may be comparatively crude but workable methods in order to make complex systems tractable and contribute to the steady accumulation of reliable knowledge that will ultimately form the basis of a sophisticated understanding of the phenomena in question. Uh, so here they seem to be referencing the construction of thin descriptions um, as something that has contributed to what they see as a relative success of biology over anthropology uh, and this somewhat controversial claim that maybe this is why cultural social anthropology has been much less demonstrably productive. So cultural selection models um, often construct thin descriptions of cultural phenomena that enable the generation of generalizations. Um, so think about variables that can be inputted into a mathematical model. Ethnographies, in contrast, typically construct thick descriptions that are more resistant to generalization. So think about a highly detailed description of a small group of individuals participating in a ritual and what they say about what that ritual means to them, and their individual communications with each other. Uh, and I'll get into an example in a second. Uh, but I should say that there has been a lot of work and discussion around thin versus thick descriptions, including uh, by people here. Um, but my 
aim with this project in particular is to think specifically about the non-epistemic aspect. Um, so I think there's been a lot of work about the epistemic aspect, about the explanatory role, um, about the role in understanding, but I'm interested in this non-epistemic side and I'm kind of setting debates around the epistemic or explanatory benefits to the side here, to the extent that that kind of separation is possible. So my example is from the cultural group selection literature. Um, and without going into the ins and outs of cultural group selection too much, um, can broadly think about it as cultural selection on the group level. So there's various processes that have been said to count as cultural group selection, but roughly you have a set of groups, a population of groups, which vary in their cultural traits. Um, this has effects on fitness and one or some of these groups outcompete the others. An example here um, is competition between the Nua and the Dinka in 18th and 19th century Sudan. This is a very, very highly cited case. So you find it in, for example, Pete Richardson and Robert Boyd's book, Not by Genes Alone, but it also comes up again and again in a very similar form in a lot of work in cultural group selection. It's often seen as a paradigm case. And so the cultural group selection story of this, um, uh, of this phenomena, phenomenon is you have these two ethnic groups that are in competition and the Nua were more successful in military confrontations with the Dinka, which resulted in Nua invasion of Dinka lands and the assimilation of many Dinka into Nua groups. So this is a case of intergroup competition where fitness differences and cultural traits led to the replacement of one group by another. Um, and so it's claimed that both groups inhabited similar environments and possessed identical technology, and therefore we can assume that the success of newer groups over the Dinka was the result of differences in culture, and in particular sets of group beneficial cultural norms that gave the newer a selective advantage in these confrontations. Specifically, newer groups had higher bride prices compared to Dinka groups, and the higher bride prices, of which the currency was cattle, meant that newer individuals had to keep larger herds. Larger herds meant that more cooperation was necessary between newer settlements, and this cooperation meant that they were able to mobilize larger political units during warfare, and therefore newer beliefs, norms, and practices spread rapidly across the region, and Dinka beliefs, norms, and practices declined. This is the kind of standard cultural group selection story. And here I'm gonna provide what I would call a, thick, a thicker description of the relationship between the Nua and the Dinka. So it isn't a really thick description like a detailed ethnography, but I would say that it's thicker in that it attends to particularity and context. So Southall indicates that individual communities of Dinka or Nua varied and still vary widely within themselves with the Eastern Nua being more similar to Eastern Dinka in many ways than to Western Nua, for example. The norms and practices of the two groups have been deeply interconnected and show many similarities due both to the emergence of the Nua out of the Dinka and the assimilation of the Dinka into newer groups. And rather than newer culture simply spreading across the region, the incorporation of Dinka into newer groups led to changes in cultural practices, such as rituals and religious practices. So you get a slightly more complex story about assimilation and exchange, and there might also be differences in the level of assimilation and exchange from practice to practice. Uh, and Douglas Johnson um, talks about how Egyptian conquest and later British colonial rule originated and reproduced stereotypes of the Nua as usurpers of land and as enslavers of the local population, which were fueled by existing racist notions of African savagery. According to Johnson's historical analysis, these stereotypes heavily influenced the anthropologist Evans Pritchard's seminal study on the two groups, as well as the subsequent anthropological work which built on it. The colonial government forcibly separated the Nua from the Dinka in the areas where Evans Pritchard worked, preventing him from observing the Nua engaged in normal relationships with the neighboring Dinka. He relied heavily on reports from government officials and European travelers, which emphasized warfare and the dominance of the Nua over the Dinka. 
Uh, however, these, report, these reports are limited to a few areas of the overall newer territory and represent a short span of newer history uh, and therefore aren't a comprehensive survey of newer Dinka relations. And he appeared to have overlooked references of cooperation in preference uh, to the narrative common to 19th century accounts of newer victimization of the Dinka. And Johnson suggests this has led to the systematic underestimation of the impact of Dinka culture on newer practices and beliefs and discounting of the possibility that movement of Dinka into newer society had fundamentally altered the newer social system in any way. So in this case, we do have some anthropological evidence that directly destabilizes the cultural group selection explanation. However, I'll set this aside here, but for these purposes, consider the way in which the cultural group selection explanation presupposes these two neatly bound groups with two sets of cultural traits that are in direct competition. So group one outcompeting group two means either that members of group two are killed or that members of group two are assimilated into group one. And all that's meant by assimilation here is the move from being labeled group two to being labeled group one. Uh, and a thicker description of these groups involves considering processes of exchange, development, colonialism, and the messiness of assimilation along different dimensions. Um, the downside or potential downside of incorporating these thicker particular descriptions uh, is that it might make it more difficult to analyze cases such as this as an instance of a more general process. So to take this um, as an instance of say cultural group selection. Um, but it seems plausible to me that these choices to abstract away from certain features where you're discarding certain elements and certain evidence while retaining others. So for example, the acceptance of these colonial narratives uh, that these choices are value laden. And then lastly, it seems that this pull toward thin descriptions is at least in part motivated by uh, valuing generalizability as this epistemic virtue. And we could raise the question of why emphasize generalizability over uh, other epistemic values if they come into tension with other values. And here I want to turn to Helen Longino's work to shine some light on how privileging generalizability might have a non-epistemic dimension. So Longino has this list of feminist virtues, which she contrasts with standard or mainstream virtues. Um, and for her, the feminist virtues are empirical adequacy, although this is shared with the standard virtues as well, but the rest are not. Um, we have novelty, we have ontological heterogeneity, complexity or mutuality of interaction, uh, and those are two I'll, I'll come on to in a second, and then applicability to human needs and decentralization of power or universal empowerment, uh, and these last two are more pragmatic. And those get contrasted with consistency with theories in other domains, simplicity, explanatory power, generality, fruitfulness, or refutability. So for Longino, the standard virtues have their weaknesses and in certain contexts have pernicious socio-political consequences, uh, but more generally have also often been taken for granted as virtues. Her feminist virtues aren't necessarily specifically feminist, and she notes that they've been taken up in a range of contexts, but she suggests that feminists should be interested in these virtues insofar as they serve feminist cognitive goals. And so she says that feminists uh, generally aim to dismantle the oppression and subordination of women. And therefore the cognitive goal of feminist researchers is to reveal the operation of gender by making visible the activities and processes of gender that have been made invisible and identifying the mechanisms whereby uh, women are subordinated. And so inquiry regulated by values and theories characterized by her feminist virtues uh, is more likely to reveal gender than inquiry guided by the standard or mainstream virtues. And so even though she's speaking in the context of gender, I think we can expand this to think about power relations more broadly, um, including race, etc. And I want to just briefly explore what it would mean to embrace these virtues in the context of cultural evolution. So she defines ontological heterogeneity um, 
as a preference for theories and models that preserve the heterogeneity in the domain under investigation, or that at least do not eliminate it on principle. Uh, the, um, an approach to inquiry that requires uniform specimens may facilitate generalization, but it runs the risk of missing important differences. Heterogeneity is thus opposed to ontological simplicity and to the associated explanatory virtue of unification. So embracing ontological heterone heterogeneity might mean, in this case, attending to the local context rather than focusing on the aspects which enable broad generalizations or a, the ability to identify the case as a token of a type process, uh, i.e. cultural selection. And she defines complexity uh, or complexity or mutuality of interaction um, by uh, saying, while heterogeneity of ontology tolerates the existence of different kinds of things, complexity and mutuality, recipro reciprocity characterize the interactions. Feminists endorsing this virtue express a preference for theories representing interactions as complex and involving not just joint, but also mutual and reciprocal relationships among factors. They explicitly reject theories or explanatory models that attempt to identify one causal factor in a process, whether that be a dominant uh, animal or a master molecule like DNA. And I think we see this kind of uh, complain or we see Tim Ingle gesturing at a similar kind of thing when he says humans are not just products of gene environment interactions, they are themselves both singly and collectively the producers of their lives. Each life is a local history produced in and through the unfolding of social relations within which it is born along. And these histories together make up a process of evolution that is going on throughout the life world. This relational approach to evolution is radically at odds with orthodox Darwinism, with its focus on the selection and retention of inherited context dependent variation, and to which the majority of biologists and psychologists still adhere. So um, if we buy Longino's argument, then I think that maybe gives us an appreciation of this non-epistemic dimension of the choice of epistemic values or virtues that seems to characterize cultural selection. So the practice of producing thin descriptions of cultural phenomena isn't specific to cultural selection or California school work. I mean, it seems to apply just as well to, to a lot of work within the Paris school. Um, but uh, approaches that embrace complexity or interdisciplinarity could be seen as already uh, aligning themselves with Longinot's virtues of ontological heterogeneity and mutuality of interaction. Um, and I'm thinking about the contributions in the book Beyond the Meme um, and also uh, Tim Ingold um, seems to embrace a kind of developmental systems theory approach to culture. And perhaps it's the case that these non-epistemic considerations could give us an additional reason to pursue these kinds of approaches over others. Um, but this wouldn't mean that thin descriptions have no utility or that we should issue generalizability entirely. But I do think we need uh, more of an explicit understanding or awareness of the value ladenness of the construction of thin descriptions and the choice of thin descriptions over thick ones. So to sum up, politics and values do play a role in cultural selection research and cultural evolution work more broadly to varying extents. Identifying these values and making them explicit allows for careful consideration or weighing of the risks um, and harms against the epistemic benefits and the ability to think through strategies for mitigation. Any research which is carried out by those on one end of the spectrum of power and privilege um, with or onto highly marginalized groups will likely carry risks. Um, so um, there are a lot of risks that happen um, with research on indigenous groups in general. However, I've suggested that cultural selection research has these particular features that incur these particular risks of harm. So I've pointed to the de-emphasizing of agency and the construction of thin descriptions of cultural phenomena. Um, and although it's not the case that all cultural evolution research is carried out with marginalized groups, a substantial proportion is, and it shapes the way we think about indigenous cultures and traditions. So I think that's something um, that's really worth paying attention to. Thank you.
Thank you, Azita. So at this point, uh, we will transition to the commentary, which will be coming from Bill Wimsat, who is Professor Emeritus in the Philosophy Department at the University of Chicago, and also a resident fellow at the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science. All right. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to return to Minnesota, and uh, uh, especially to be commenting on Zita Chalapu's uh, uh, very interesting paper. Um, I think, by the way, that she has uh, highlighted the fact that the discussions of cultural evolution, modern discussions of it, have pretty much left politics and values uh, completely out of it. And I think it's important to be uh, uh, engaging in that. So next slide, please. Alan? You should be able to see the next slide. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, oh, wait a sec, maybe I have to move it. No, it's not moving. I can't see it. So I... It's still, on, yeah, right. Can you see it now? There we are, okay. All right. Um, so let me say, I agree with Chalapu about 19th century progressive evolution and social Darwinism. And this is damned cultural evolution for many social scientists. To make the dangers of European and generally ethnic perspectival bias more obvious, uh, I want to note a Japanese diagram of the progression of man uh, found by Stephen Gould. I couldn't find it for this presentation, but uh, our representations commonly have European uh, man at the <laughs> last stage. And notice it's man, not woman, uh, who is the primary uh, midwife of culture. And, uh, but uh, the Japanese diagram has a Japanese man with the European man, only the penultimate stage. Uh, next slide, Ellen. And reductionist sociobiology, uh, which infamously is single locus models uh, and simplistic evolutionary <laughs> psychology give little if any improvement. Uh, now improvements have to come from increasing complexity of both. So Darwin, for example, on the expression of emotions in man and the animals is more sophisticated than either of these. Uh, and one could do better if one wants to try to biologize uh, cultural evolution with a multi-locus uh, dual inheritance theory with population structure, with a much more sophisticated and culturally informed multi-dimensional developmental psychology that embraced cognitive, social, and cognitive aspects. Uh, next slide. I agree also with Chalapu that one should explore the effects of applying a model of cultural change to the analysis of phenomena. The effects may introduce biases, even though there's nothing in the model that's intrinsically biased. Thus, genetic models draw attention away from epigenetic or cytological inheritance uh, through focusing on the importance of genetics, and they also uh, uh, abstract away from the importance of environmental inputs and plasticity. Uh, next slide. It agreed that thin descriptions tend to de-agentify. For example, if we describe an agent as a maximizer, it simplifies the process through which he, uh, the agent decides. Unlike, for example, satisficing, Herbert Simon's satisficing model, which makes history and learning important. And it would do so more obviously if we hadn't so strongly among philosophers and economists internalized the rational decision account as the logical form of decision making. Uh, this tends to de-emphasize the role of history, learning, and also motivating context. A thin description is an implicit assertion of what is important unless systematically qualified. Here, the use of multiple complementary or sometimes even disagreeing uh, this thin description because of, uh, it may disagree because of different idealization. Usually the multiple complementary thin descriptions can help. Next slide, please. Uh, by the way, I'll come back to uh, an extended example involving that, that parallels uh, the newer and Dinka account. Uh, another area is biases introduced by reductionistic research and modeling strategies may induce both thinner and de-agentifying descriptions. Um, uh, I spent a great deal of my career studying these. Uh, 
So first of all, descriptions that uh, are reductionist tend to ignore, ignore the role of the environment. And Thin's descriptions of action by removing causes or motivation. Uh, secondly, reductionistic descriptions may commit functional localization fallacies by identifying entities or behaviors at the subpersonal, uh, for example, the neural or biochemical levels. And thus, for an eliminativist, these would de identify the personal level since they're taken as competing rather than articulatory. Uh, next slide, please. The Ebo Debo approach uh, that both Alan and I would favor emphasizes learning and development of empowering capacities and skills and choice of what one learns and how well in an eight structured model of the individual that includes also the social, institutional, and technological structure of their changing environment. This is, I would point out, a constructed niche. Thus it is that differs from individual to individual. Thus it is at least makes a place for agency and can foreground it. Moreover, the Evo Devo of institutions, this perspective can also be applied to the development of institutions, the technological niche and the organizations can go far in explaining systematic cultural differences. Next slide, please. One can manipulate agency and its points of focus through the structure and values of the family and broader institutional and organizational modulation or determination effects on curricula, on rewards and social connections and social structure. So although the Ibo Debo approach does not include power relations intrinsically, it has room to model them through institutional, organizational, and technological filters and differential emphases. Uh, next slide, please. De-identifying is problematic often, but the reverse can be true. Thus, in the US, where individualism is an ideology, we have an excuse for selfish individualism and for the sort of idiocy that arises when people in the US oppose vaccination mandates as compromising their individual rights. One must still, however, be wary of ethnocentric bias in sources of theory and data. And there's a famous paper by Henrik and other authors uh, talk about, talking about weird uh, subjects. Weird are Western, industrialized, educated, rationalistic, uh, democratic uh, individuals. And as my wife, uh, Barbara Wimsatt has urged, agency can also differ in degrees and in different respects. Uh, this points to a, as the uh, uh, vaccine mandates point to a respect in which we ought to uh, de-emphasize the individual uh, rights. Uh, next slide, please. Multiple thin descriptions can thicken the net description and explain different aspects of behavior, thereby enriching the account. I'll illustrate this with an account of the frequency of hemoglobin uh, S, the gene for sickle cell anemia in the countries of West Africa. This account, by the way, is derived from those of William Durham's book, Coevolution, Genes, Culture, and Human Diversity, Stanford, 1992. It's uh, suggested just to be another dual inheritance approach, but it's significantly different. Uh, uh, Durham's background is very interesting. He was an undergraduate at Stanford and then got a PhD in population biology at Michigan, and then was brought back to Stanford to join its anthropology department. So he ended up having a much uh, more biological perspective, and but being in an anthropology department, his approach to these problems is much richer not necessarily by adding thick descriptions, by adding, but by adding multiple intersecting complementary thin descriptions. Griesemer and I urge this perspective and also the cultural phenomena are variable consistency, that some aspects of culture, simple legitimate aspect, examples of mimetic dynamics may be thin. Next slide, please. The Paris School, uh, Sperber, Heinz et al, introduced psychological biasing factors expecting perception, reception, selective transformation and transmission, which are not the story or even the central mechanism, I suspect, of cultural evolution, however. I'd point out, by the way, 
that their interest in the persistence of pattern is perhaps more often better explained by the generative entrenchment. It's a central uh, uh, feature of the um, uh, Evo Devo approach. The weird subject bias indicates the possibility of cultural rather than psychological biases uh, in this case. Uh, next slide, please. Now I'm gonna switch uh, to an example I used in my bio course um, uh, of um, uh, spatial heterogeneity, population structure, history, and culture interacting in explaining the incidence of sickle cell uh, uh, disease and malaria. Um, okay, next slide. I'm going to flip through here rather than, uh, this is normally a whole hour and a half lecture. So I'm gonna flip through these slides in under five minutes, maybe three minutes, uh, just to indicate the multiplicity of factors that Durham brings to bear. We have on the left, a political map of Africa with the countries involved and the, uh, uh, the sickle cell genes, there are three independent origins of HBS uh, in the area that used to be the Congo, uh, but sort of uh, uh, to the center and below of uh, uh, the um, uh, bulge that is West Africa. Uh, and it spread into uh, the Southern part of the African bulge. Um, uh, the countries around the coast all the way to Mauritania. Uh, okay, and uh, you see on the right, the geographic distribution of hemoglobin S in Africa, with it being much more intense uh, uh, up from Angola or around to uh, Mauritania. Uh, and what he seeks to explain is the distribution of these intensities. Uh, he draws on data from 150 different villages. Um, okay, go ahead. Next slide. Uh, this compares, we saw a hemoglobin S versus the political map on the preceding one. This is the distrib graphic distribution of another variant, hemoglobin C. And he actually doesn't have much to say about that, but I've applied a population genetic model for the co-evolution of three alleles at one locus a more complex case um, uh, to explain that. Uh, let's go on. But notice there's a peak there in uh, Mali and, and Niger and south of that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, in order to work on this, he needs to also uh, look at, uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is a picture just of the, phenot uh, of the equilibrium distributions of the three genotypes Big A, big A, big A, big S, and SS. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, in order to estimate the uh, frequency of malaria mosquitoes, um, he has to look for another indicator, and he gives independent evaluation. In fact, that uh, uh, rainfall is a very uh, uh, good indicator, although. Uh, one has to look not only at total rainfall, but its distribution throughout the uh, uh, season in order to understand the uh, re response of the mosquito population. Uh, and I won't go into detail as to how that's done, but uh, it's, it's a significant measurement problem, solution one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, he also considers variables, uh, including the uh, language, uh, 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 variation in languages. And, and language, uh, uh, language is spoken as a strong indicator of uh, ethnic boundaries and also of mating. So if you wanted an explanation, uh, if you wanted to invoke inbreeding in populations or crossbreeding, uh, you would wanna know the distribution of languages. So then that's a cultural variable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the same region, only looking uh, south from the Sahara Desert to the different... Uh, uh, oh, no. Uh, slip. I'm sorry. Can you go back? Yeah. Um, uh, to the different uh, crops raised, sorghum and millet, uh, rice and yam. Uh, with overlap of sorghum and millet and yams. Uh, 
And it turns out that the crops raised um, uh, involve the time spent in the field and uh, the possibility of um, uh, water accumulation, which gives breeding spots for mosquitoes. So um, uh, this is another variable uh, affecting uh, the uh, incidence of uh, um, uh, the incidence of uh, uh, malaria. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, I won't go into it here, but uh, uh, this is about uh, looking at the distance from the predicted equilibrium value uh, in a given region and what actually happens. And that's another component of the explanation. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna go on. These are graphs of the incidents in various areas and how well they fit the predicted curves in terms of the, uh, in terms of the parameters. And what he does is spends a lot of time explaining why they deviate from the predicted generalization curves. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, go on, next slide, please. Uh, and here he has, but leaves unexplained, the, uh, the incidence of hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C and shows that they're largely disjoint. And that can be explained, I can't do it here, in terms of looking at the interactions among uh, HBS, HBA, and HBC uh, loci. It turns out that HBC homozygotes are fitter than any other homozygotes and would be expected to dominate, except that in a population that already has HBA and HBS in it, HBC can't invade unless, unless there's a good deal of inbreeding, which increases the frequency of the HBC homozygotes. So population structure becomes important there and history becomes important there. So uh, with that, I've just uh, discussed most, but not all of the factors that Durham brings into his explanation. He also talks about, uh, as I say in detail, different farming practices and in one village, the practice of uh, cleansing uh, the uh, eaves with a flaming torch uh, of the residence areas that happens to be where the mosquitoes congregate. Uh, so um, there's enormous, uh, uh, enormous cultural variation, uh, enormous, uh, uh, often looking for deviations from the simple models rather than, um, uh, rather than how it covers and predicting deviations from the simple models. So I wanna suggest that this, although it's actually a biological phenomenon, has the kind of thickness one would that, that a cultural anthropologist would want only uh, uh, generated by applying multiple thin descriptions. So let me stop there. Thank you. Hello. We're done. I was just stopping the share. So thank you, Bill. Um, Great content, and uh, Azita, what I'm gonna do is give you a chance to respond, but before I do, let me invite those who are in the audience. If you do have a question that you would like to ask Azita, that you go ahead and use the raise your hand function, and we can build a queue while uh, we are getting started here. We have uh, a couple minutes for uh, general Q and A. Um, and if you raise your hand, I can then call on you and uh, let you ask your question. So Azita, uh, let's bring you back up and uh, uh, give you a chance to do a quick response. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for um, those really helpful and insightful comments. Um, yeah, I, I very much agree that I, I think that um, an Evo Devo approach would largely not have these kinds of um, potentially pernicious sort of political consequences um, in that it's possible to make room for agency, it's possible um, to talk about power relations. And I think when you have a kind of, um, I guess, pluralism or in this interdisciplinarity, when you want to bring together different kinds of descriptions that also can do something. Uh, to mitigate effects. Um, the, the one aspect which I agree with, but I, I'm struggling to think through is, is this question of de-emphasizing 
agency, sometimes it seems to be bad, but then sometimes it actually seems to be good. Um, and that definitely seems right to me, um, but I'm not quite sure yet how, how to think about that. Um, maybe it's something that just has negative consequences in some contexts and positive ones in others. Um, maybe there's some kind of principled way to think about it, but I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Okay, so let's go to some questions from those uh, uh, watching. And uh, the first one is uh, from uh, Mike Travasano. So, uh, Mike, you should be able to talk now. Hi, um, I really enjoyed your talk, Azita. And of course, it's always interesting to hear Bill as well. I was wondering, so I really enjoyed it with respect to agency among the people who are the, the, uh, the focus of investigation. I was wondering, thinking back in terms of the parallels with respect to population genetics and evolutionary genetics, how do we, or how is it decided among investigators who gets agency? Huh. Because they seem to find agency all on their own and I'm not sure how that's adjudicated moving forward. Um, so is the question why in, in some cases, the sort of subjects of the study are seen as having agency and other cases not, is that? The question is, uh, you know, so of the people who make, who are doing the investigation, they don't yeah. seem to have any problem in, having agency in the sense of actually doing it. And so, and that, that's not a new thing, right? And you, as you point out, and I'm wondering how that's gonna be moving forward, how decisions or if that's even possible can be made about deciding who makes, gets or has agency with respect to investigators as opposed to investigated. Right. Um... <laughs> I think it's a difficult question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's very interesting how, um, I mean, in some of these cases, like I don't want to pick on Henrik too much, but these examples that come to mind, like I think in his, in his 2015 book, he has this case of um, these uh, groups that rear pigs and pigs are important to social status and some group doesn't have as much as many pigs but they supposedly blindly adopt the traits of a nearby successful group this is a kind of blind success bias um, and these practices are things like um, not killing your pigs um, and feeding your pigs more and it's really striking to me that somebody who has written a whole sort of complicated and rich book couldn't imagine that another person could work out that not killing a pig would mean you have more pigs. Um, so I think there's this really interesting and sharp distinction um, about the agency of the researchers. Um, and in terms of making the decisions, I don't know, I think that's a really difficult, thorny question about kind of scientific governance that I haven't thought too much about. I mean, I think the next step for me would be to think more carefully about positive um, suggestions and maybe even as kinds of best practices um, for this kind of work, particularly in marginalized populations. Uh, but it's, I'm not quite at that point yet to give any kind of coherent answer, I think. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. I really enjoyed your talk. All right, thank you. Let's go to the next question uh, from uh, Emily Schultz. Emily, you should be able to talk now. All right, one thing I wanted, I, first of all, I loved your presentation. It's the sort of thing I've been waiting for and some of the people in the audience will know, talking about myself for over 10, 15 years. I'm an anthropologist by background, trained as a four field anthropologist. So many of these multi-stranded approaches that have been suggested by Bill and others are things that I was trained to try to do from the very beginning when I was in graduate school in the early 1970s. And so I've, I've sort of lived through a lot of this. I am now retired also. So I sort of feel like I've been fighting some of these same battles uh, my mm -hmm. whole career. And to hear you articulate all of this with such great uh, sensitivity uh, in a way that I've not much heard before is just very re reassuring and kind of uh, gratifying. So thank you so much. 
the question I, I guess I would want to pose is uh, one way the, of, well, two things. First of all, the kind of as a response to the previous question, I think in anthropology, we've been working certainly since the 1990s, if not earlier, at collaborative forms of research where we uh, do not undertake any kind of research in any of the fields of anthropology that involve local people without uh, talking to them about it first, enlisting them, or even having them suggest the kind of research we should do, and setting up a team that it does work jointly together and uh, that talks about how to publish or what, you know, even write together. There's an anthropologist who talks about collaborative research and collaborative writing, you know, from beginning to end with, with those with who, who are your interlocutors. And so uh, we have been doing that, at least some of us in anthropology for a long time and been stressing this. Um, and that, that also requires a, a recognition of reflexivity, which is, again, something anthropologists, at least cultural anthropologists, have talked about for decades. But I have found a remarkable lack of, uh, among other people in other disciplines who maybe are more committed to a positivist approach. And that's seen as somehow tainting things if you, if you try to be reflexive. <laughs> the other thing was, with regard to uh, one thing you did not mention, but I think Bill might also want to comment on this, is niche construction as an approach that would include a lot of the things that are left out of selectionist accounts. And um, certainly this is a direction that my own work has taken. And I, I've been working for, for a number of years um, on niche construction in anthropology explicitly. And I would only want to mention the work of someone who I guess we claim is an anthropologist, that, which is James Scott, his book Against the Grain, which is published in 2017. And he has uh, been a wonderful interlocutor. I think we call, consider him an anthropologist, even though his degree is in political sciences or science or something. But this book is terrific because he actually takes the term niche construction. He uses it to explore, uh, talk about the sort of deep history of the world. And it's deep history, not cultural evolution that he's describing, which includes all sorts of uh, things that happen that are unexpected and send things off in different directions. He it reads against the grain. He refuses to accept that somehow settled agriculture was the telos toward which all human evolution was pointing. And it really sort of destabilizes all of the hierarchies and sequences that have sort of been taken for granted for a long time. He does a wonderful job and reaches across many disciplines. And I would certainly recognize, recommend that as and, and other work on niche construction as well. Uh, as a way to go to kind of get away from some of the difficulties that you point to, which I recognize. I'll stop talking there. Thank you very much. Great. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you so much uh, for that suggestion. I'll definitely um, check out that book. It does seem to me that niche construction is a kind of productive avenue that avoids some of these issues. Um, and just on your first point, um, I agree, I think, um, so I'm I'm not as familiar as maybe I should be with with all the developments uh, in anthropology and this reflexivity, um, but I'm sort of generally aware that these conversations um, are longstanding and ongoing, and I think there's probably a lot to be learned by cultural evolution researchers from these kinds of discourses um, and this possibility for collaboration and participatory research. I think sometimes. I mean, so my sense is that with some of these researchers, and I'll use um, Joseph Henrik again, but um, so they are trained, uh, they do have anthropological training, and I, I think he might sort of, yeah, push back on any kind of characterization that, that he's completely uh, divorced from anthropology. Um, and he, in his field work and in his group, they do kind of go in and embed themselves in local populations uh, for months and do, and I think sometimes, you know, em employ some of these ethnographic methods. So I think it's interesting that that in the end, when it comes to the published work gets translated in this particular way. Um, yeah. So Bill, did you have a specific comment on this topic? or something else. You you actually are muted, Bill. Can you unmute? Thanks. Um, yeah, Emily, I've really appreciated your work and perspectives. Uh, and let me say, though, uh, to reemphasize what you said, I think niche construction is the uh, domain of, of cultural inheritance. Uh, and the main criticisms I would have of the niche construction literature is it isn't nearly developmental enough. The development is sort of a black box, uh, they're terrible, but they don't talk about the structure of development and dependency relations, which is where generative entrenchment comes in. 
and Griezmann and I have both uh, uh, pursued this. Thanks. So we've got a couple of comments in the chat. So let me read those out and give Azita a chance to react to them. So one from uh, Jim Griesemer. Uh, excellent talk and commentary. A comment. I would add emphasize to what Bill said that one reason adding multiple thin descriptions can thicken an evolutionary account is that the multiplicity can reveal where the account together. Many problems of development live in those gaps, I think. Mm -hmm. nice. Zita, you want to respond to that? Um, yes, uh, I, I completely agree. Um, I think maybe this is less common right now, but I, I, I do know, I mean, at some points there have been some cultural evolution, or at least maybe cultural selection researchers that have made very bold claims that set up this opposition that it's about being this this cultural evolution is the the way of thinking about culture and maybe cultural sectional population thinking um is the one way and this is kind of competing paradigm with the others and you can see in that masudi paper from 2006 this kind of cultural anthropology has been demonstrably unproductive in this kind of language um so i think i mean th that that kind of attitude um <laughs> leads to these particular problems but I, I don't i think my sense is that it's a bit less common nowadays and it's it's great to see i mean what the work like beyond the meme or something which is like specifically uh encouraging and promoting this more interdisciplinary approach to to culture Okay, and then from Terry Bristol, uh, on the relation between the explanatory agenda and the agent perspective, I am reminded of Leibniz's position that the value of studying human physiology is for the development of a social medicine, where citizens can be educated about how to live a healthier lifestyle. Yeah, um, I definitely think there's kind of a big question to be asked about the entanglement of kind of non-epistemic and epistemic aims in sort of the study of culture as a, in general. Um, I guess what I've tried to do with what I've picked out is, is to look at, um, in Heather Douglas's terms, these indirect role of values. Like I didn't want to say directly, well, we can go from negative consequences to shutting down this research, but rather that values come in in this more um, diffuse way. But there is this bigger question of, um, are we only studying culture for, um, for epistemic goods? Or are we trying, do we also have some, some kind of broader political or social aims? And how should that guide the kind of research that gets done? So quick follow up from Terry. Um, uh, Warren Berger, a more beautiful question. Why are we doing it living this way? What about an alternative Foucault current lifestyles or attempted solutions? Thank you. Thanks for the suggestions. I'll look into those. Yeah. Great. Well, that is bringing us uh, up to the end of our time. And so let me uh, thank Azita for a wonderful talk. Um, really great to have you with us in this forum. And congratulations again on your new position at the Open University. Um, thank you, Bill, for your commentary and joining us uh, in this forum as well. And thank you to everybody who was in attendance. Uh, we appreciate you joining us and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you very much.